but especially by those people who have really built bridges uh, between uh, different areas of design and, and their collaborations and cooperation uh, with architecture. Even though probably there is no uh, systematic one-to-one -one correlation between uh, Hossein and, and any architects yet, I think it's uh, fair to say that there is uh, a great deal of uh, understanding of both materials and spatial conditions, spatial situations within uh, many of his projects and many of his, uh, his designs. Um, and uh, it's uh, uh, certainly great to have him here tonight. Uh, Hossein Chalayan is the winner of the British Fashion Designer of the Year Award for both 1999 and again in the year 2000. He is a graduate of St. Martin's College of Art and since 1994 has been showing biannually uh, during London's Fashion Week. Uh, uh, Chalayan has gained a reputation as one of fashion's most innovative and talented designers. The New York Times deemed his spring-summer 2000 collection as personal and brilliant as it gets. Uh, in 1998, he was appointed head designer of the American Line C in New York. His unique approach to fashion has included techniques such as making clothes from washable paper or uh, hard molded plastic and uh, rusting fabrics. So you can already see that there is uh, certain, uh, at least, analogical connections in terms of the use of materials uh, with architecture. And I'm sure there'll be questions at the end uh, <clears throat> from all of you, hopefully, uh, on many of these topics. Uh, before uh, Hossein makes his presentation, we will have an introduction. And uh, the introduction will be given by Judith Clark. Judith is curator and founder of Judith Clark Costume Gallery, an experimental venue established in 1998 to exhibit both contemporary fashion and historical dress. Judith has lectured and written on dress widely and has worked as a consultant for the V&A, the Hayward, and the Barbican Galleries on issues of dress display. Judith was responsible for commissioning and exhibiting Hossein Chalayan's remote control dress for spring summer 2000. Uh, please welcome Judith Clark. Good evening. Well, I'm of course delighted to have been asked to introduce Hussein's lecture this evening, and in doing so, look at some of the themes that run through his already considerable body of work. This privilege has been increased because it has provided the opportunity for extended conversations with him about his work and access to an archive, the variety and beauty of which is truly inspiring. To look for themes or references is an investigative role looking for a series of analogies, using one image to fix or explain another, as though a true genealogy of design can be established. History serves to legitimate, as improvisation is difficult to legitimate, outside the cult of genius. We look for a chorus of consensus. The closer the reference, the more convincing the story. Even though a repertoire is more interesting than a conviction, offering the possibility of diverse redescriptions. The writer and psychoanalyst Adam Phillips begins his most recent book, Promises, Promises, with a T.S. Eliot quote from Virgil and the Christian world. If the word inspiration is to have any meaning, it must mean just this, that the speaker or writer is uttering something which he does not wholly understand, or which he may even misinterpret when the inspiration has departed. Amy de la Haye, in a survey of British fashion, the Cutting Edge Exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum a few years ago, characterized a lot of the work of British designers as romantic modernity, referring to designers, however radical, paying overt reference to historical styles. For example, we can picture Westwood's Rococo fantasies or Galliano's Belle Epoque muse. Hussein Shalayan's work, though participating in the dualism of that tradition, is not so easily placed. His laboratory is not one of mood boards. It is as though shapes are instead remembered, and sometimes only partly remembered in some more abstract way. History for Shalayan seems to be made up of a disparate history of traces, those of national and ethnic or even religious identity, 
or Im images morphed through travel and, cultural and culture mediated through personal experience. One dress contains the memory of the last as collections show us different solutions to an idea involving us in some way in his process. In these few minutes, I want to look at perhaps the two most commonly used labels attributed to Hussein Shalian's work. The first, that of Orientalism, or typically, as we are talking of fashion headlines, East meets West, reiterated in different ways. It refers at least in part to his own geographical roots in Istanbul and its boundaries in both Europe and Asia. The other is that of fashion's futurist, encouraged this year, of course, in response to the general preoccupation and increased speculation regarding the new millennium as though we need to be given glimpses of what is in store, as well as an answer to Stanley Kubrick's odyssey. Both labels are justified to differing degrees, but what is immediately interesting to me is that they are traditionally placed in opposition to one another. For example, futurism male, orientalism female, hard surface versus soft flesh, the harem inside, the metropolis outside, one romantic, one shunning romanticism, one extravagantly decorative, the other promoting a streamlined graphic aesthetic, and so on. The first, Orientalism, is a historical term used to describe the West's fascination with and assimilation of the ideas and styles of the East, and as such is a fabrication of the West. The mystery gave Europe the promise of an earthly paradise. Undefiled by its structure and rules, vested with this mystery, it remains always other. Orientalism is not a picture of the East or of Easts. It represents longing, the option of faraway perfection. It is like the idea of utopia, a picture everywhere and nowhere save the imagination. This sustained longing for renewal is usually typified by the Thousand and One Nights, the Sher Azad syndrome. With the exception of Ovid's Metamorphosis and obviously the Bible, few works have had such a profound and lasting influence on the English literary tradition as the tale of a thousand and one nights, or the Arabian Nights, as it has often been referred to. Like Ovid's exhaustive compilation of Greek and Roman mythology, the thousand and one nights is not a single tale, but a generically diverse and kaleidoscopic collection of ideas shunning singularity and reveling in multiplicity, never allowing its re readers to rest on any one narrative shore. Again and again in the collection, we encounter individuals whose lives depend upon the responses of their listeners to, to their tales. Motivation throughout is curiosity, ever renewed. As the tales were told and to retold, the stories were constantly being transformed and rewritten, memory and oral history, each time altered slightly when given a new context or a new audience. When talking to Hussein, the words memory and echo are used a lot and are concepts that fascinate him. The fragmentary memory of constellations or the words of a foreign language, sections of dresses are omitted, for example, not so much as though to play on tailoring, but almost as though they once belonged to a dress only partially remembered, details repeated as though creating a familiar chorus. As the picturesque paintings of the 19th century, impressionistic, not ethnographic, the, ever, the images never rest on a specific time or place. We know it's far away, we know we'll never get there. Hussein invests his designs with motifs that speak of a sort of generic ethnic identity, as in the image behind me, not specific to one time or place. Unlike a dress with one shoulder may signify, for example, a sari, the Indian national dress, or square sleeves suggest a kimono, Chinese pagoda collars, etc. It is as though it is strangely familiar, but we're not quite sure where it's from. The silhouette of the hood cuts across the cheeks as would a tied scarf or a pinned veil, suggesting Eastern Europe or the Middle East. If indeed his creative roots reside in Turkey and indeed their important influence, then his Orientalism is certainly not reminiscent of, reminiscent, excuse me, of Poiret's extravagant Oriental ball or Lady Wortley Montague's uh, disguise, but instead it is projected into a speculative urban future. What would have been a veil is instead a protective cape made from opaque wood, the consistency of a blanket. Maybe the search here is for asylum. Maybe the dreamed of mobility is instead flight. 
Capes are both protective and concealing. We escape cloaked in darkness. Cloaks conceal our identity, the shape of our body, even our gender. How many images do we carry of refugees protected by blankets drawn over their heads? Orientalism that is a romantic ideal here becomes the memory of roots, of displaced people. Historical futurism is, however, antagonistic towards the past and any form of nostalgia, as though a value in it of, it, of itself could come forth in all its radical purity only from the destruction of the old in a violent break. It was Marinetti who in 1908 raised the rallying cry for the abolition of the past and a famous love for speed, the energy that propels machines and man's domination over nature, over technology, over nature through technology, excuse me. I'm going to read Walt Whit a section of Walt Whitman's famous poem to a locomotive in winter. The dense and murky clouds out belching from thy smoke stack thy knitted frame, thy springs and valves, the tremulous twinkle of thy wheels, thy train of cars behind, obedient, merrily following. Through gale or calm, now swift, now slack, yet steadily careering, type of the modern, emblem of motion and power, pulse of the continent, for once come serve the muse and merge in verse, even as here I see thee. With storm and buffeting gusts of wind and falling snow, by day thy warning ringing bell to sound its notes, by night thy silent signal lamps to swing, fierce-throated beauty. There is an aggression in this feared fierce-throated beauty, however, which is absent in Shalayan's world, though technology certainly is his muse. Shalayan looks to motifs from the technological world, famously through his aeroplane dress, complete with moving sections. Movement is both implied and inherent to the material, as well as for compositional inspiration. Futurist motifs are present in the image behind me, this time to do with movement, not so much literal, but in its historical synonym, dynamic composition. We are reminded of the avant-garde love of the asymmetrical, the, diag the diagonal projected beyond the frame or the proscenium arch or the spiral in Shalayan's work, the uneven layered hemlines, here extended with triangular sections. The sleeves or flaps are not only invested with the shape of a quick brush stroke, but as you can see, the edges are blurred, as though to suggest with alternative edges. It makes me think of the multiplied images of Boccioni's cyclist or Giacomo Balla's abstract speed, the futurist dream of conveying movement on canvas or in stone. Instead of coupling it with the sound of motors, he adds a solo piano or a Bulgarian choir moved from urban chaos. The model walks on mirrors and in, is reflected in a wall of mirrors, breaking the boundary between floor and the wall. It is as though her, it is through her reflection that we find our bearings in this place. Within a new world, the complexity of which I believe will be explained to you this evening by Hussein. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the Architectural Association for inviting me tonight. I feel very honoured. Um, I've been coming to the lectures here myself um, occasionally um, until like a couple of years ago um, when I started to travel too much to be able to actually come. Um, and, you know, it's a, um, you should all feel very privileged to be in an institution like this where there's so many sort of inspiring ideas and um, people that come in to give you talks. Um, I've been to a few, um, we went to the um, um, Ursula talk the other night, and uh, it is quite bizarre to be here myself, um, you know, as one might guess. Um, a lot of the work I'll be talking about is in itself 
in themselves generally quite abstract. Um, I start off with quite concrete ideas and uh, basically I abstract them to the extent that um, they become quite instinctive and um, at times it's difficult to explain them with words. So um, I don't think that my, um, my talk tonight is going to be extremely verbal. Um, I rather some of the images sort of stood for themselves. Um, so, and um, also I'd like to thank uh, Judith Clark and Lena Wells for um, helping me organize this talk. Um, it's been a long process um, and um, I'll start. Right, the, um, this first project um, is called uh, Between. Uh, this was um, um, spring summer 1998. Um, we work seasonally in the sort of fashion industry and uh, you, you show that biannually. Um, and uh, so I will be referring to the names of the collections as you know, within the seasons. Um, this was um, the whole idea of um, the whole idea of uh, how we um, define our cultural and graphic territory in space. And um, basically, um, this was represented through either dress code, um, traditional dress code, or a graphic way in which you can um, define a territory. And these were, this was a small exercise which um, um, well, took place in the beach, uh, and we asked the girls to take a piece of string and do whatever they like around themselves, and we documented the whole process, and one of the images, or well, two of the images we used, um, in one as an imitation and one as a program for that particular show. Um, and um, basically, I'll just go through them first. <laughs> Um, this idea was um, the idea of using um, negative space as the graphic way in which we can define um, territory. And uh, this led, this was a small exercise again, I only selected a few images because there were quite a few of them. Um, which led to um, this, this idea, which was the beginning of that particular show, where, um, the, you know, people wearing um, traditional costume or uh, something that represents their belief in masses, how it creates a monumental sense of territory. Um, and this was, like, um, inspired by... Um, they, they, they kind of reminded me of uh, Peruvian... Um, priestesses and uh, and the the squares on their heads um, were in a way the negative space around the head. Um, this was to represent the anonymous and the semi-anonymous ways in which one can define a territory, um, where you know the face would be totally hidden by this wooden um, egg shape. And this was sort of semi-anonymous. Um, this idea was um, to reflect um, an audience, which was an attempt to question the spectator and the uh, personal territory relationship. Um, again, um, sort of relating to the first image that you saw. Uh, this was... Um, referring to the uh, negative space around the body, again inspired by the um, wireframe images that you saw um, a few slides ago. Um, this was um, basically um, an isolation to the extent that the body somewhat acquired this mummy-like state. Um, again, um, this came from um, the same kind of shape, but the print was uh, based on uh, rays of light. So the idea was 
that um, the light was contained within a silhouette and so the body became a space in itself. Um, this was again the idea of the light waves preventing the body from movement. Right. Um, this idea was uh, based on deconstructing a territory and simultaneously symbolizing uh, a nature-nurture relationship and uh, the way in which uh, one can evolve from birth through uh, nurture which uh, leads to a, a deathly uh, state. And this, some people read this as, um, as, as trying to shock and that kind of thing and I felt um, it was difficult for me to sort of justify you know, the idea at first and uh, eventually through um, interviews that followed I was able to express the genuine idea behind this. Um, this was uh, playing with the contradictory relationship between the attempted anonymity and the uh, uh, attracting pattern on the chador. And this is the final image from this uh, show. Uh, this was again um, the whole idea of this uh, monumental way in which um, a mass can define a larger territory. So this, the next project Um, this project um, was more exploratory than um, a project with a certain narrative or a conclusion. Um, I think I was going through um, a, a period where um, I was trying to um, sort of learn about the world, I suppose, in, in different ways. And um, so I feel this is something that uh, started to run through my work from this project onwards, where things became questions rather than statements. Um, although, naturally, one, one could say that, um, you know, um, even suggestions in themselves are statements. Um, and this uh, was inspired by a quote from Wittgenstein's Tractatus, uh, which says, um, what you cannot speak about, you must pass over in silence. And uh, this led to the idea of how certain parameters um, and constructs like religion, language, and technology uh, create a sense of loss of self and uh, the idea of man creating certain parameters and losing himself in them. Um, this was a small um, projection that we had in the show at the time. Um, the girls holding the boxes um, symbolized an attempt to understand and dis you know, how we di under try to understand and dissect and punctuate reality. Um, each girl holds a fragment of a spectrum of real um, colors, colored boxes which came from the pixelization of the original image. Uh, there are infinite ways in which the boxes could be arranged and uh, this culminated in the idea of um, infinity um, where parameters were eradicated and distinct cultural identities where the body became camouflaged and multiplied by mirrors um, were no longer there. And uh, again, this was an attempt to um, sort of echo the face um, in, in more than one way, and, and the whole set was made of mirrors. So this, um, within the environment, um, kind of got camouflaged to an extent. And again, these were to sort of try and create um, heads which um, in themselves were, became creatures of some kind and you couldn't sort of, you could call it uh, a semi, um, I don't know, I mean, semi-robot, semi-insect. Um, I mean, they became sort of undefinable and that's what interested me. Um, and then certain dresses were inspired by the idea of loops and uh, seamless, um, seamless details which in themselves uh, had a, no beginning or an end. These were again um, the, the, the idea of camouflage. Um, and these, this was uh, it's one of my favorite images um, where the 
mirrors were multiplying the um, the, the procession, and uh, again, it was the idea of um, you know the loss of self and this whole idea of camouflage and uh, sort of a lack of identity. Um, this next project called Geotropics um, was based on the idea of um, meaning of a nation, um, how a nation could evolve, how mountains create natural boundaries and how rivers of um, encouraged conquests and uh, cross-examining um, interaction between nature, culture and nationalism and the consequential need to expand. Um, this image was inspired by Rus Russian propaganda posters and for me it, it seemed like this sort of dispute over a boundary and it, it kind of um, was so sort of textbook um, that you know we used it as our imitation again for that particular season. Um, and um, basically we created like a microgeography with the body where costumes mapping the nomadic flux of the slope route were morphed into each other. And next I'll show that um, morphing process. Right. Right. Stills were taken from this um, from this uh, morphing process, which was an attempt to plot the changes through distance and time uh, within the vastness of land um, on the Silk Route. And uh, these are some of the drawings that came from it. And this is actually a dress that we uh, chose to make from one of the stills. Um, this image, um, again, which was uh, the way we had the, the, the models in, in that show, um, was an attempt to sort of create a similar expression on the girls' faces um, so that there was this sort of um, universal look to the, to the girls. Um, these are again some of the dresses in stages. Um, these are again um, some processes that we decided to keep and realized as garments, where the clothes peel or they, they drop down in, in stages. This was the idea of like containing your, um, carrying your environment with you, um, and we made these uh, series of head um, headdresses that uh, were quite, um, um, they were like perspex boxes. Um, the these 
worn wearable chairs represented the idea of an itinerant existence of the nomadic flux on the Silk Route. And this was um, the final part of that show. And this was the dress that came with them at the same time. Okay, the next project I'll be talking about is called Echo Form, and um, I'm going to show you a small exercise um, that we uh, worked on, um, which didn't actually inform directly um, the things that followed, uh, but it was the idea of um, using movement and fragmenting parts of the body in movement to create an infinite number of compositions, which was the idea of how movement can inspire form. And this is what came from it. And um, these were, again, a series of morphs that uh, helped me develop the idea. Again, these were um, images that um, really became like a warmer to the um, to the things that followed. And the, um, the whole idea was based on um, how all entities um, are an externalization of the body. Um, and one example was um, the idea of sound, which perhaps pre-exists in the functions of the body, um, and uh, which could have started by repetitive pattern um, um, as a sensation felt in the womb, which then perhaps is sustained by our de external experiences of rhythm. Um, speed, for instance, speed, for instance, was another um, important aspect of this collection, uh, which was the idea of um, um, how we uh, take body's natural speed and we enhance it technologically. Um, and um, another idea was um, how we look at, um, how, how we externalize and contain and reconstruct memory, um, altering the way which a daily object can be perceived. Um, um, I focused on car interiors, uh, which converge the idea of um, the uh, ergonomical um, amplification of the body and the experience of speed and movement. Um, in relation to that, I also looked at the idea of um, the transitional state created by flight. Um, right, um, I think the next thing is the animation we're going to show you um, in representing the uh, the work with flight and um, movement.
this was the idea of um, memorizing and how we contain certain memories of um, daily objects and we decided to do it on genes and um, this was a small exercise again that uh, you'll, you'll see actual garments um, that we chose to uh, realize in, in slides to follow. I mean, the ultimate object of this pr project really was to um, echo back onto the body, um, um, which itself created the infrastructure of what was projected back onto it. Um, so it was the idea of externalizing and uh, in being inspired by almost like negative space around the body and then echoing that back onto the body. and. Uh, this was from, uh, from an exhibition that we did um, following the show to show uh, images of the clothes a bit more closely because all these shows uh, pass by and people don't really get to see things in detail. This was again um, the garments that we realized from the uh, small animation you saw a few seconds ago. This was, um, again, garments uh, sort of growing, um, you know, onto the one onto the next model, and this was uh, a th something from the show of that season. This was uh, a, a project that we did again for the exhibition, and it was the idea of um, becoming more sort of integrated into the background. Um, there was a series of them. Right. Um, now, the next project uh, is called uh, Before Minus Now, and uh, it was inspired by the idea of um, um, using the intangible as a means to create form. Um, uh, in this light, um, I was looking at, say, gravity, expanding forces, uh, the weather, technological forces between entities, uh, and uh, wave and wind detecting objects. Um, this image was used as the invitation. It was like sort of the try to create this sort of ridiculous image of a boy trying to control a plane. And uh, again, you would you saw later on in the show um, where, where this led to. Um, this was to create like a, a journey for the boy before uh, he actually controlled the dress. Um, this. Idea. Oh, I'm reversing a little bit because um, this was quite a difficult project to put together. Um, this particular one was based on the idea of um, uh, formation of mountains through erosion, and uh, again, it, which was a, a kind of a force in itself, and uh, led to the idea of a sh shaved tool, um, which started from a block and would be shaved and transformed into a specific um, shape. Um, and this was some of the processes that we documented. And that was actually the final image that we had on the show. Um, this was another image um, that we had in the show, but uh, there wasn't a, a slide of it from the show. And this was actually the dress uh, that uh, the, um, the boy is connected to. Um, and uh, it transformed in stages. Um, this idea, again from the same collection, um, was inspired by the idea of expanding forces. And the, I the idea was that the dress would be cut bigger and it would be um, um, shrunk back to the body. So you had this, um, you consequently uh, destroyed the details. Um, for somebody who wouldn't know, they might think it's just a frilly dress, but um, it really wasn't. <laughs> um, 
this was um, the idea of um, how a f uh, force waves can manifest themselves um, as crystallized fins. And uh, again, this, this was a particular abstract collection where a lot of the ideas made sense to me in my head, but there was sort of everything manifested themselves in different ways. Um, This was uh, um, a, a remote controllable dress that we designed for Zaha Hadid for the Millennial Dome. Uh, we actually never went in there, um, which I'm quite pleased about at this stage. And, um, and this was then, um, this was actually commissioned uh, by Judith Clark um, for Zaha Hadid. Um, and it's at the uh, Judith Clark um, Gallery now uh, as part of um, Judith's archives. Um, basically evolved from the, um, the dress you saw within the collection and uh, it was just, um, it was something that moved around as well on its own and the idea was you can wear it, you can control it on the floor. Um, it was kind of multifunctional. Right, um, the next collection is our latest collection. Um, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show the, a video of, one of, our, um, of um, one of our shows, um, but it's not the latest one, it's the one before, and, uh, because we felt it was more appropriate to show it as a video, it was a better video. And this particular show I'm going to talk about now, and collection, is the latest one. Um, and this was about... Um, um, how in societies um, established moral and value systems are obliterated at the time of catastrophe, um, like wars or natural disasters. And um, drawing from this condition, um, we created a series of alter egos um, in caricature form, uh, which were turned into computer animations uh, displaying a short lifespan um, with a, within a virtual environment. Uh, lacking social and moral structure. So basically it was just like, um, um, like a cartoon, cartoon up to a point, um, which I wanted to um, incorporate with the actual real event. Um, so this was followed by a performance featuring the real clothes, um, and these echoed the alter egos as seen in the animation, and the idea was to create an interplay between the real and the virtual set of circumstances. So we will show you the animation that um, took place in the beginning of the show. We had, um, um, like, we had some music on the background. Um, we generally tend to use live music um, depending on what the show is. Um, Unfortunately, we couldn't play any music today, um, so I will just um, be silent. Again, this is, this is some, somewhat like a visual poem where um, everything is, I mean, totally exaggerated and um, comical up to a point. Um, but really the interesting aspect of this animation for me was the interplay between this and what happened afterwards in the live event. Um,
A lot of the work that I do is um, quite collaborative because obviously we don't have access to this equipment or the experience. Um, so I do tend to um, collaborate with a lot of different people from different disciplines. Um, so ge generally, uh, they, it's very time consuming because people we have to understand each other's language and um, a lot of the time, um, because um, uh, fashion is a sort of entity in itself, um, a lot of worlds really don't know enough about it and so it is generally very hard to uh, find people interested in uh, collaborating um, because most people are used to things that are going to generate some kind of enterprise in one way or another. Um, and an animation for a show at times is just something that we do for a show. It's not something that we sell or we're not going to necessarily put it on the internet, or we may, but um, it's not j something that could, is going to generate something uh, o overall. Um. Basically here she sacrifices herself and it was like sort of we're trying to create this sort of manga type image. Um, um, so really the hand movement isn't um, something that uh, you know represents spirituality or anything like that. It was just a, the kind of thing that you'd see in a manga um, Japanese uh, cartoon. But this was um, the idea of, um, this was the first um, outfit from that show um, and it rep represented the sort of second stage before reality um, um, and this appeared both on graph paper and on plain fabrics and it was the idea of drawing a garment. Um, so really what we did was um, we had this sort of speculative or this contemplative uh, stage uh, that we wanted to show together with the virtual imagery. So it was this idea of um, showing what you'd contemplated, but actually as, um, as garments themselves. And this was the idea of like scribbling out an idea um, and the idea of um, the uncertainty and about the way something is or could be and uh, again this was represented on graph and lined paper sort of fabrics that resembled these things that we had specially woven. And these were again like rubbing out details on a dress um, but actually turning it into a feature itself. Right, this was, um, I, I, I like the idea of the, um, of the use of poppies because of its connotations, uh, because they normally grow on battlegrounds. And uh, this was, uh, the poppy image was something that was quite um, present in the animation. And, um, and the idea was to use it as a, as, a, you know, as a means to create a sense of location and, and reality through perspective. And uh, this dress uh, represented the idea of how fragments of the field um, have converged with the dress um, as she may have walked through the field. Uh, this was um, the idea of um, fusing two different realities, uh, displacing their usual connotations. So it, was part, it would be part of one garment on another. This was all um, made in, um, again, this fabric that was woven for us, which resembled like graph paper. Um, again, this is the idea of the fusion of, uh, of a 
um, denim garment with a normal classic jacket. So um, again, sort of displacing their, um, their usual place, their usual connotations, excuse me. Um, again, same idea. Um, this was um, the idea of um, something that could have left its trace behind. These were, these were shapes that we, we would place on a, on a garment. Um, we would then treat the garment so it would leave this uh, trace behind. And again, it, was, uh, it felt right in relation to the fusion idea where you had a trace of something that may have uh, pre-existed on the garment. This was again part of the, the scribble idea where you would scribble out features. This was, uh, this seems a bit unrelated, but again, but again in the flow of the, the, the show and the collection, it, it made sense. Um, and this was inspired by the idea of um, fusing images of plants to the extent where they became unrecognizable. Unrec and um, this was again uh, trying to echo the animation. And uh, we made these um, dresses um, which were cast in glass resin, um, which represented, represented the, uh, sort of the intermediate sta stage between uh, the real garment and the, um, and, well, the real garment and the animation. Um, and uh, this was kind of to try and create a bridge between um, an animated starting point um, and an end result, which was um, these resin dresses that were wearable but breakable. How did that come up there? Yeah. So this was like the, the um, how we finished that show, where these dresses, uh, which were like almost a ghost of the dresses that broke them, um, were they were sort of standing along, they were standing by each other, and it, this, each girl um, broke the dress and. Uh, Again, this was to sort of try and reflect what happened in the animation where the, the dresses had broken, um, you know, where they sort of smashed and uh, it was glass-like. So really, um, the, this, the most important aspect of this whole project was to the experience of seeing the animation and then seeing um, the girls come on afterwards. Um, and that's it for that. So the, the next thing I'll do is I'll, I'll show the video of the show which was before this. It was called Afterwards. And um, we felt this was, again, like the best video to show you in terms of the way it was shot. And it was based on the idea of um, having to leave your home at the time of war, um, hiding possessions uh, prior to a possible raid, and creating the means to carry possessions away more easily. Uh, for instance, like a, a pocket would be shaped to hold an umbrella, or a pocket would fuse with a handbag, um, or, um, or a shirt would be joined to a jacket so that it can be carried away more easily. Um, hence, the performance became an opposition between full and empty and uh, the idea of carrying, carrying your environment with you. Um, so we'll pay you that video, and it's, not, it's the last 15 minutes or so, so I'll, I'll sit down and if there's any questions afterwards.
Thank you, thank you. Um, um, we couldn't avoid we couldn't avoid the uh, the show as it was because the, we couldn't separate the sound from the actual film. So, you, you know, the 
background was a little bit embarrassing, but it wasn't intentional. I'm sure there'll be some questions for saying. I know for a fact that uh, Jacques Herzog would like to have one of those skirts, the last one, you know, the, the one. Do you know? So, so. Yeah. What to use is what? I mean. Well, I'm sure he would he would like it because it's very similar to some of the some of the projects that he's designed. No. Um, um, maybe there are some questions. I mean, one of, one of the uh, things that often when people are talking about the chador. You know, and the whole idea of sort of covering is that the emphasis is put so much on, on the fact of covering. And uh, of course, it also obviously highlights very specific features of the body, and it's just as much about revealing. And it seems now seeing the work that this aspect of, of undressing or revealing is, uh, seems to be a very important part of the way in which you're really constructing Many of the many of the dresses to kind of undress, and when you were discussing the work, uh, I suppose there is also an incredibly kind of sensual side and a kind of erotic side to the to the work that you didn't touch on because you discussed it in, in very much uh, terms that had to do with references and the ideas behind the work. I wonder whether this idea of of dressing as undressing or dressing as revealing is something that you could maybe say something mm -hmm. about. Well. Um, I think that, you know, for me, um, if you reveal parts of the body, again, that in itself creates um, a f new form in a way where even though it's bare, um, that in itself becomes part of the composition. Yeah. And um, I mean, for me to um, sort of talk about things like sensuality, um, again, it, it becomes like um, sort of purple journalistic writing. Mm. You know, it's. Um, and I think that uh, for me it's very much to do with form and really it's to do with the compositional um, aspects of what I'm trying to, to achieve, whether it's um, to do with the process or whether it's to do with um, like um, applying a, um, you know, being inspired by a sort of a negative area around the body and then applying that back to the body. So really it's, it's, oh, it's this sort of, um, I always feel like there's this sort of universal law and I, I sometimes feel that, you know, me and my team, we tap into it um, and at times we, we don't and it's to do with um, really um, also at times like the garments being the idea themselves or the garments serving the idea where, mm. you know, in this show it was supposed to be like... Um, somebody's wardrobe in a way and you know we would never do a floral shirt or a floral dress but we felt it was relevant in terms of um, the fact that somebody would have a garment like that in their wardrobe and um, so it was like their wardrobe sort of through our repertoire of, of ideas say so again it, it very much um, like if the garment itself is the idea where in the morph the, the collection to do with the morphs uh, that is the case uh, the idea itself is not uh, the garments are not serving the idea, they are the idea. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, that in relation to what you're saying is kind of what, uh, how we sort of build the whole thing up. But it's interesting that the body is constantly part of this well, I think dialogue, in a way, with the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the clothes themselves. Well, I think that um, the, the body, you know, obviously the, the body is the most sort of central aspect of my work, and, um, you know, whether there are objects around it or whether it's a garment, it's whether, you know, it's it just, at, at the end of the day, is, is uh, sort of put into life uh, by the body. And um, so for me, you know, revealing is, is as important as adding on. So it's, it's simply um, to do with um, the composition. And, uh, and there are times where something either feels right or it doesn't. You, 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 you would add on a certain amount and take off a certain amount. Um, and it, it's very much instinctive, I'd say. What is, what is the relationship between uh, form for you and the use of technology? In a way, you were showing a lot of the, the computer animations and then you stopped and said, well, we took something from that animation and here it is. But, I mean, visually it's clear maybe what, what you took, mm -hmm. but somehow in terms of the way in which the use of animation is also setting up a new, f new process that presumably might be different uh, in terms of the method of working compared to what you must have done 
you know, earlier. Is, is, has that made any well, kind the, of significant difference? The process for me has become like a work in itself. So we've now found a way, found, uh, uh, we found a way of showing the work um, in, you know, in terms of exhibitions and um, in terms of um, basically mediums uh, through which you can really understand uh, the processes more. And um, so generally the animation, uh, for instance, or the morphing process uh, is for me to sort of, is for me be, to be able to design from it, um, although it's a work, piece of work in itself. Um, so really, um, the, the, the work, I, I think, is generally quite evolutionary, like one thing leads to another, and we have like a, a central sort of cause or, or, or concern, and we, we sort of take, um, we take uh, journeys from there. Um, so yeah, the process has become to be, has become very important for me in the last sort of few years, and it is something that uh, is, you know, isn't enabling me to sort of have exhibitions as well as um, shows like this because um, people don't really get to see and understand how you've evolved and how the idea has actually come about. And um, so yeah, I think. I mean, I don't know if I've understood your question yeah. exactly, but I think to my. Um, maybe there could be, I could keep asking questions, but maybe there would be there some questions from um, Julia. Can you wait for the microphone? So can we? Could you tell us a little bit about... Wait one second. Oh. Yeah, go could you tell us a little bit about the material that you use? Um, quite a few of the students at the AA are introduced to your work um, via your um, using very contemporary the question was about materials for ones who haven't heard it and why I mean why we use these materials and how we use them well I mean um, generally speaking it's very very hard to um, to source materials um, because a lot of the com companies that would have the materials that would be interested in would be people like NASA who would never you know, you would, they wouldn't look at twice as a fashion designer, you know. And uh, basically, I think um, we try to develop our own materials through mills that we, are, we have relationships with. Again, it's limited because um, a lot of the technology that, that I would be interested in is not within the fashion industry. And um, so a lot of the time, like the plastic dresses and all that, they're, they're very simple materials. It's just the way, we're, way they're executed. And uh, another thing is that, you know, we, like I said earlier, we collaborate a lot. And so I do work with industrial designers, and I work with artists. Um, so there are, you know, basically we at times have access to their materials. But in terms of the clothes, um, generally, um, you know, they're normal fabrics. Maybe they're a bit more sort of expensive bit more expensive because of the um, effort that's gone into developing them. But I don't think there was any revolutionary sort of materials there that really I can talk about, except that we would have like, I don't know, a graph um, pattern on a, on a you know, this woven as a graph, and uh, that would, you wouldn't be able to readily buy that. So um, for me, it has to feel nice as well. And a lot of the time, when, you, when you're working with these new materials, when you go to these uh, you know, fabric fairs, uh, and you know they call them like novelty fabrics, which is an awful term. But they don't usually feel very nice because you know they have, um, you know they have uh, a lot of synthetics in them. So we really what I mean what we're trying to do is not just to use this sort of you know I mean it may, may look different to what it is, but a lot of the time we just want the materials to feel nice and be desirable. So it is really because it is a business what we're doing and. Ultimately, all those things that are more experimental are usually done for the shows, and they become showpieces. Can you speak to the mic? Hi, I'm interested in the models. Um, are they just a tool, or are they aware of the process or the ideas behind? Are they interested? The models. Um, <laughs> well, uh, basically. Um, um, you know, we, we try to, they, they are there to show your clothes. And um, obviously, if, if some are more understanding of what's going on, you know, they're going to, because of our choreography and like, you know, for instance, in the, you know, in, in the part where the girl would have to 
work out how to put on the dress, and we had to rehearse it, but not many times. A lot of the time, they, they, do, need to, they do need to sort of um, be quite quick in grasping things, but a lot, a lot of them, you know, it varies. I can't comment on that, but... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think ultimately we've built a relationship up with, this, with certain models that, that, um, that we use all the time, and they understand the way we work, and it's become like, an un you know, there's an understanding and I feel it does help because our choreography is usually quite complicated. You know, I work with a director, um, with a choreographer who draws up diagrams as to how they're going to walk and use the periphery of the space, whatever. So a lot of the time they do need to focus and if you come to the back of the shows, there's all these diagrams on the wall just before they go out to see what they actually have to do. Um, but, you know, because this is... Um, we're not really part of the sort of fashion world in the way you would think. Um, you know, it's very much a small team of people and, you know, we, um, in terms of the, um, you know, the, it's all about creating relationships with people so that, um, you know, they'll come back and, you know, and basically that's how we've evolved through all these um, different relationships. Clearly embrace technology in your work like through a multi multidisciplinary. Can you speak to the mic? Sorry. <laughs> um, although you clearly embrace technology in your work, um, you have a very multidisciplinary approach. Um, you discuss the idea of loss of the self through technology. Uh, would you consider yourself technophobic at all? No, I don't. I mean, I think the idea there was that um, how we create certain parameters um, in order to create order in the world and how, in effect, we sort of find ourselves lost in them. And, um, and that, that could be sort of either religious or it could be cultural um, in, in a broader sense. So really it was about questioning um, those man-made parameters and uh, which in themselves are probably um, a measure against um, a f fear or threat of, of not being in control. But it wasn't really a comment on, or, you know, man versus technology and um, sort of all these sort of predictable sort of science fiction um, comments at the moment that, you, you know, you may, you may see around in, in general media. It, it wasn't coming from there at all. Well, I was wondering, uh, I seem to recognize several references to, um, to the Schlemmer um, choreographies in the Bauhaus. You are aware of that? Oscar um. Schlemmer and his... Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's really very, very similar the way uh, that uh, uh, the reference... Well, this egg you build around the heads or even the, the skirt, the last skirt we saw. I seem to remember similar images from these choreographies well, of Oskar Schleber in the Bauhaus. Perhaps, but I think that generally um, the work that we do is to do with a con context and we do what is right for the context. So yes, that you may have seen similar things, you know, in Cubism, in, in Futurism, whatever, but I mean, we don't open textbooks and take a reference. It's to do with, okay, we're going to build a living room and we're going to transform the you know, the furniture in the living room into something you can carry. So the idea here was that you would transform a, a skirt, you know, a, um, a table into a skirt. So what can we do to do this so we can empty out the room? So it's really this sort of uh, uh, evolutionary way of thinking that leads to the designs. It's not for me like, um, I mean, at times, you know, you, uh, you do things and people have made similar things to it, but it's all about the content that, you know, you're working on and um, really it's more important because everything has been perhaps done it's about how you interpret it and how you work on it but I'm not I mean I'm not I'm, I suppose if I look at about how I spoke I would see similar imagery but it wasn't from that point of view at all can you maybe say something about what I think Judith touched on this in terms of the whole sort of east-west mm -hmm. question and uh, uh, the way in which of course, there are, there are references that, that came at the beginning, but now 
the more you're working, the more your sort of uh, projects develop. How do you feel about this idea of, of the initial references <coughs> of the projects? Because in, in the last video, for example, with the music and mm -hmm. with the, there was again a kind of return to some of the mm -hmm. similar sort of situations that I think uh, Judith showed with the, with the first slide. So that kind of reconciliation of reference and maybe technology, but specifically on the question of reference. Mm -hmm. What to to the to east? Really, yeah, to the east. I mean, well, uh, for me, it really is based on, on, on you know, it's, it's on project basis. Really, um, it's um, again a lot of the. I mean, this particular the, the video that you saw, it was inspired by the whole idea of of uh, displacement at the time of, of war, and you know, and we, we used Bulgarian music because it felt right. Again, it was one of those instinctive things that were like prayers almost, and. Um, Generally, I'd say that there are certain projects that have no um, cultural references, and there are some that do. Um, I, I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm from northern Cyprus, and you know, I'd, I'd say that my, you know, my culture does affect me up to a point. But um, I've also been sort of brought up here, and you know, I'm kind of, I, I, I feel generally that um, what happens in the, you know, in the West is you, you become. Um, aware of your own skills and you're encouraged to um, look at your own skills and, and evolve them and you don't necessarily need to constantly make um, references to your uh, background um, in order, I mean I don't, the work is not supposed to be um, specifically Eastern, it's just um, if you're working on a subject matter which um, somehow involves the East it isn't necessarily to do with my background. No, 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 I didn't mean it in that sense. I meant it in the sense that the, the, the issue of identity or the word identity or the construction of identity right. came up quite a few times, both mm -hmm. you know, in, in many yes. of the discussions. Yes. And I meant it in, in the sense that obviously the reference to the East sometimes is helpful because mm -hmm. I suppose those are the people who are, in terms of some of the presentations, are more explicitly connected to, to, the, to, to notions of right. marginalization and then having to construct new forms of identity. Mm -hmm. So the degree to which, in mm -hmm. a sense, fashion or dressing yeah. also helps to contribute to this idea of identity becomes uh, independent of whether it's East or West. Yeah, but understand. now, Hossein Chalayan, as someone who is, in a sense, engaged with the project of construction of identities through dressing, right? yes. in that sense, I think it's, yes. it's a sort of mixture that you can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd say, I'd say yes. I mean. Um, the, the work um, I mean, does um, touch very much on the sort of whole notion of identity generally, but I'd say that's something that runs through um, again not in the in the projects that are uh, based on um, concepts and their abstract ideas, more on the you know more on the sort of cultural um, sort of projects that you've seen tonight. So I think. Um, Generally, I, I think I'm interested in the sort of issues of identity overall, whether it's Eastern or Western, because there are also identity issues also within the West. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there are so many subcultures within the West that you, know, you can draw from. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, I mean, overall, um, it, it, it's, it depends on what I'm working on. And uh, I, 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 you know, one of the Im most important aspects of, of, of what I've shown you tonight, I think, is, is the fact that you know, the, some of the work Serve, serve an idea, and some of the work is the idea themselves. Um, that's kind of very important to point out to me. Mark? Um, one of the things I noticed is, I mean, it started with the image uh, that Judith put up, um, but then refers to, like, a number of the, the kind of garments. Uh, it, what struck me was not so much as it were East meets West, but the way in which the garment often kind of bisects the figure uh, in the middle, and there seems to be like a hybrid overall uh, as between not sort of east and west, but actually between mother and daughter. Um, I mean, quite often it feels as it were, it's the mother on top uh, and the kind of daughter kind of below. Uh, and that has, I think, an incredibly, I mean, it's an incredibly inventive way of disrupting, as it were, the idea of fashion's model is the woman, where it's always a kind of narcissistic fantasy of a sort of flawless identity. But I mean, I'm wondering if it Well, I think for me, um, actually, um, 
another thing that come that relates to that is this whole idea of um, that we kind of create a monument in a way, and then we get inspired by it to create, create clothes. That that kind of reminds me of also of this point that I wanted to mention earlier. Um, yes, what, what you're saying I think is is an observation, and it's, um, it's, it's quite a poetic one, but which I can't really say anything on, I, I, except that I can see what you mean. Um, but in, in relation to that, um, um, you know, um, parallel to what you're saying is, is this idea of creating a monument and then being inspired to actually create the clothes from it, where, you know, for instance, um, the sort of aeroplane-like aeroplane dress led to the brown dresses that you saw in the animation. And that, I think we've created this sort of way of working, um, which is sort of, again, run, which is running through um, generally. Um, the, the, your comment on mother and daughter idea, and this, the dress being split into two, um, I think generally uh, the clothes, um, in, in some way, um, have... Um, you know, there's supposed to be sort of a life to the clothes in a way, and I think that the sort of dynam dynamic aspect of the clothes, which may be what you're referring to as being cut through, I think is there really for me for it to have for the garment to have a life in some way and movement. So for me, like dynamism isn't really. Uh, I mean, I won't get into it, but that's a thesis in itself. But um, you know, the, I think the shapes really are th are there to give um, some kind of a life to the garment, and. Um, as if it's gone through something, or if it's come from something, or as if it's evolved from something before. I think there's always a sort of suggestion of that. Um, and I, I guess, you know, it's great that you can be interpreted in different ways. There is, maybe that could be the last question then. Hi. Thank you. Your your last example here uh, was, in a way, uh, related to an hypothesis of war of wartime, and your first first examples were, in a way, uh, you you talk talked a lot about inspiration, Oriental Oriental inspiration inspiration in a sense. Do you think that the last example it's in a in a in a, in a way a mixed of these two of an hypothesis, in a sense and. Uh, uh, as well an, as an inspiration. Um, again, I, d I didn't look at the sort of the, the project as as being specifically oriental. Um, I think that um, Judith's introduction about orientalism and exoticism and all that I think um, is 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 something that um, is there aesthetically, perhaps, um, and um, perhaps you know it, it was present in terms of. Um, that you know, we, we refer to folkloric costume up to a point um, and try to sort of turn it into a, a, you know, a wearable um, garment as much as possible. But I, I wouldn't say um, um, you know, that it particularly referred to um, Orientalism. I think it's, you know, Again, I chose this subject matter, and I wanted to decide, you know, create, I wanted to create this opposition between full and empty, and this idea of, you know, how you can carry your environment with you, and how quickly you can do it, and hence, you know, there was all these details on the clothes where you would hide your possessions, and, you know, garment where you'd have another garment sewn onto it, so you can just carry it more easily, so you wouldn't have to look for the second one. So it was this sort of um, the look, idea of looking at a situation, and. Um, and in a way, creating a, some kind of an anecdote or a narrative um, to, to um, express the idea. And a lot of the time, they are abstract, and they, they may not make sense to you. Like some people were thinking that it was like a bourgeois family leaving their home, and um, because we decided not to talk about it afterwards. And uh, so there was all these sort of interpretations in, in the papers like the next day. So it really is, uh, if you read it that way, um, let it be, but it wasn't what, and you know, that's also a, a rich thing in itself that it can be interpreted in many different ways, but it wasn't where it came from. I thought I said that was the last one. Why didn't you? Go on. Thanks. You've got the mic. I just want to ask a question with regards to the um, uh, models again. Is there a reason why it's all females? Or you talk a lot about identity, and it no. seems... 
I'm There's just no curious reason. to know if it's... No, we just, I, I just work on... I, I make clothes for women at the moment. Yes, I, we have plans to do menswear too, but it's not, you know, um, it's not in the plans right now. So it's just because I work on women's wear, it's not specific. Um, Would you treat the men's body different? Sort of, because several things here could be general for males and females, but several things are extremely feminine. So I'm just curious to know how would you be dealing with a male body? Yeah, I mean, there's a whole different. <laughs> well, it's a whole different, uh, you know, entity. I mean, I, I would have to. I mean, I, I think it would be more from my personal point of view and males that, are, that I know well, what, of what they would wear or how they feel in things. So I'd say that if I was to do, if I was to do clothes for men, it would be very, very personal, because I don't. I mean, how else could it be? It's, it's I don't know. I think that's a great moment to stop. I want to thank Hossein for thank an you. incredibly inspiring presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to thank Judith for her introduction. Thank you. Thanks.